Well, like many families, and probably like most of your families, uh, when our boys were much younger, we went through a whole series of what I call family pet phases. We started with a fish phase. I don't know how many of you had fish, but we had a fish phase. And we went to uh, a lizard phase. We had four boys, and so lizards were fun for them, and that lasted until we unfortunately left the heat lamp on while we went on vacation. <laughs> a little crispy, a little crispy when we went home. And then, skipping right over the cat phase, we went to the hamster phase. Anyone here have a hamster? Ever kept a, ha kept a hamster? Yeah, we, we had a hamster phase. And our hamster phase lasted until, actually it ended with um, a psychotic hamster that we had named Furry. Um, now, psychotic may be a bit harsh, maybe more like wildly ambitious. Uh, and I knew this because Furry uh, seemed to want more than life in a hamster cage. And I could tell right when we got him, put him in the little glass aquarium with the, with the wire mesh top. From the time we put him in there, he kept trying to climb up on the little water dispenser. You know, we had the water dispenser and the little wheel. But he'd climb up on the water dispenser and he would push with both paws, I guess, up against the wire mesh like he was testing it, like he was looking for weakness, trying to find a way out that made me nervous. He did it all the time. So I'd put heavy books on top of the cage so he wouldn't t push the top off. Well, uh, one morning, I was down early in the morning um, studying or, or having my quiet time or whatever, and one of the boys came downstairs. They were young then. I don't remember which one it was, maybe only four or five years old. And I was engrossed in what I was doing, and he said, instead of saying, uh, Dad, can I have some cereal, which was usually how we started the day, he said something that sounded like, Dad, the hamper's in the garage. And I said, yeah, that's nice, bud, that's nice. And then he said, it with more urgency, he said, Dad, the hamster's in the garbage. I said, what, the what's in the what? And he said, furry's out. And so that got my attention. We ran upstairs to see, and sure enough, Evidently, the night before, I had forgotten to put the books on top of the wire mesh top, and it was pried open just enough, and there was no hamster inside. And then I realized what he had been doing all those weeks of running on the treadmill. He was training, <laughs> preparing for his escape. And then I, I heard a, a kind of a scratching sound, and I looked down in the little waste can next to the dresser where the cage was, and sure enough, there was furry you know, neck deep in used Kleenex and, and Q-tips and stuff. And I was, I was just kind of touched for a moment because I thought to myself, here he was, he, all that time planning and testing and trying and playing. Finally, one night, he pushed it just enough aside and he escaped out into glorious hamster freedom and he wound up in a garbage can. There was kind of a parable there, I thought. He went from one form of captivity to another. And we see that a little bit in the story today. We pick up again the great story of the Exodus, uh, the epic story of God's deliverance, God coming to the rescue. And let me give you just a little review to bring you back to the story where we are. The people of Israel had been in captivity, bondage, to Pharaoh's Egypt for some 400 years, long time, suffering. God calls a man named Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses. So God sends a series of plagues on Pharaoh's Egypt to demonstrate there is no God like him. And the last plague is death to the firstborn Egyptian sons. The people of Israel are told to put the blood of the lamb over the door frames of their homes so the angel of death will pass over them. That becomes what we remember as Passover. Celebrated that a couple of weeks ago. And it leads to the Exodus. Moses leads the people out to their freedom, free from captivity. And then we see, if we keep reading in Exodus 14, a Pharaoh then changes his mind again. He realizes he's just set free his entire source of slave labor, free labor, and he decides to go get them back. So he sends 600 chariots and all his uh, warriors out to bring the people back or kill them out in the wilderness. That's where we pick up the story. Exodus chapter 14. I'm going to begin in verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done in bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. 
I'm going to stop there. The first point I'm going to put up here, I'm calling the struggle, but I have to tell you, I really wanted to call this point whining in the wilderness. But I'm going to call it the struggle. And I'm going to try to explain it to you. How many of you have ever been to Disney World down in Florida? Oh, a whole bunch. So you'll, you, may, you may be able to relate to this imaginary story. Let's imagine that you're going on family vacation to the Magic Kingdom, the happiest place on earth. That's what it's called. That's what all the signs say when you get down to it, the happiest place on earth. So you tell your kids they're all excited. You're going to get them out of the school a couple days early on spring break to make the 1,000-mile trip from Chicago to Orlando where you can spend roughly $200 per person per day for all this happiness. You get as far as Indianapolis. You're driving. You get as far as Indianapolis before the first question comes from the back seat. How much longer? Then you get to Louisville. You get more comments. When will we get there? And then somewhere near Atlanta, why is it so far? You finally arrive. It's 95 degrees. You're standing in line for 45 minutes to get to a ride called Pirates of the Caribbean. Or it's a small world in the things in your... I just put that song in your head. <laughs> and then one of your beautiful children whines, or maybe your beautiful wife, or maybe yourself. And what you say is, it's so hot. Why did you even bring us here? Verse 11, they said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Do you hear it? Now let's think about this. They've survived the plagues. They've seen the power of Almighty God. They survived the angel of death because the blood was over their homes. They've escaped Pharaoh who was the guy who made them make bricks with no straw, and surprise, they begin to complain. They're complaining to Moses. And this isn't the first time, and it won't be the last time. We'll see in a couple of weeks they do it again. So why the complaining? Well, at least three reasons, I think. First, they're complaining, I think, because it looks to them like Moses has led them in the wrong direction. Take a look at this map. I don't know if you can see quite clearly, but you see the Mediterranean Sea to the top and Egypt's to the south. And they were in captivity up close to where number one there is, by the Great Sea. And the promised land is straight east, Canaan. The land of Canaan, that's where God has promised to take them. The people all know this. That's where Canaan is, straight east. But Moses leads them south out of Egypt toward the mountains and toward the Red Sea. So they think his GPS is not functioning right. They're going the wrong direction. Now, a couple of things that we know here from the perspective of Scripture. We know that Moses at this point is following closely his God. We know that God is leading them personally through the pillar of smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night. So Moses is following, obeying God. Secondly, we know that there is a, a hostile people group. Put that map back up there for a second. That, that to the east, on the way to the land of Canaan, between Egypt and Canaan, there's a hostile people group living there called the Philistines. And if the people go straight east, they're going to have to fight through the Philistines, who were advanced, warlike people with weaponry. And the people of Israel, coming out of captivity, they did not have weapons, they were prepared for a war. So the truth is, by going south, they're actually being protected by the God who is leading them, and they don't know it. I thought about that a little bit as I was going through this passage, and I wondered how many times in, in my life have I been just kind of frustrated with, with God's direction and leadership. Felt like he was maybe taking me the wrong direction when I was really being protected the whole time. I just couldn't see it, but he knows more than I know. Secondly, notice they're complaining because they can see that Pharaoh has changed his mind again. They can see the 600 chariots and the, and the uh, warriors on horseback chasing them down. On top of that, they're trapped. They have mountains on either side. They have a body of water in front of them, a sea that they can't cross. They're trapped. And they know this is not going to end well for them, and they're terrified. Now, fear is a powerful human experience. We all know what it is to be afraid. Psychologists say that fear creates a fight-or-flight response. That is, we want to fight our way out of the circumstance, or we want to flee from it. Now, the Israelites have escaped Egypt, but they're stuck in a situation where they can neither fight nor flee. They can't fight. They have no weapons. They can't stand up against the Egyptians. They can't go anywhere because the mountains are on either side and the sea's in front of them. So they are terrified. And so they complain. 
There's a third and more important reason. Notice that the people say in verse 12, Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. If this wasn't so tragic, it'd be almost funny. Really? You'd rather serve Pharaoh than face the challenges of your freedom? I mean, Pharaoh was the guy who at one point was throwing their baby boys into the Nile River to exterminate them. He's the one who forced them to make the bricks and beat them if they didn't. He's the one who made their lives miserable and bitter. You want to go back and serve him? If we go back to chapter 12, which we covered a few weeks ago, and we see that when Moses told them that the angel of death was coming, that the final plague was coming, and that they should put the blood of the lamb over their door frames, the Bible says the people worshipped their God. And they did exactly what Moses told them to do because they couldn't wait to get out of Egypt. Now they want to go back? Now here's what we need to see. When things got hard and scary, they forgot where they had been in bondage to Pharaoh, and they also lost sight of where they were going. God's promise to take them to the promised land. And here's what we need to see today. God's way of deliverance is not always safe or comfortable. Sometimes it's dangerous and very uncomfortable. And it's tempting to want to go back even if it's slavery. Now we think to ourselves, why in the world would they do that? Who would think like that? Who would ever go back? Now one of the small little footnotes, tragic footnotes in American history, has to do with the Emancipation Proclamation that President Lincoln signed way back in 1865. When he signed that document, technically every slave in the Union was freed, set free. Every single one had their freedom. However, historians tell us that many of them never left their masters. And those who did leave, a high percentage of them returned to their owners, even though they were free, because freedom was terrifying. They didn't have any guarantee of jobs or food or health care. They didn't know what was going to happen, so they went back to what they knew, even though it was slavery. And in a way, we do this all the time. That is, those of us who are followers of Christ, who believe that in Christ we've been forgiven and freed forever from the power of sin, when faith doesn't seem to be working out right, when the wheels seem to be falling off in relationships or in family or at work or with finances, we are tempted to go back, go back to the former life. We're tempted to go back to the same attitudes, the same destructive patterns, the same anger or fear that we once had before. We're going to talk about this in just a few minutes as we come to the end of the message. But we're going to begin with the struggle, the struggle of our freedom. Secondly, we move to the command. The command. Many years ago, uh, when I was the youth pastor here at FECG, I would take students on different kinds of trips, and I've talked about bike trips and so forth a lot uh, in the years past, in years since. Uh, one of the trips I, we took one year, I decided to do something a little bit different. It was kind of a long weekend trip. We were going to do some hiking, some canoeing, some uh, backpacking, and I decided to throw in um, rappelling. You know what rappelling is? Uh, anybody ever rappelled here? Okay, well, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, we were going to rappel off an 85-foot cliff. Oh, that sounds like fun. I've never done it before. Uh, this is just a sort of stock photo. That's not what I looked like when I was rappelling, which I'll tell you in a minute. But I'd never done it before, but I thought it'd be fun. We had an outfitter. He was going to teach us how to do it. And so he uh, took all of us up on top of this 85-foot cliff right up in Wisconsin. And I, I learned something that an 85-foot cliff looks a lot different when you're on top of it than when you're at the bottom of it. So he stood gets us right to the top of this cliff. We're standing right on the edge of it, a group of us, maybe it might have been 15 or 20 students and myself. Uh, and he explained what we're going to do, how the rappelling works, and he made a big point of telling us how strong each one of the ropes was. That each single rope could hold a minivan, or like seven minivans or something. They were, just, they were indestructible, they're absolutely trustworthy, and the key, he said, to rappelling is to trust the ropes. Trust him as the belayer and trust the ropes. And you'd be fine. And then he asked for a volunteer. And, and no one volunteered. 
and I was trying to hide in the back a little bit because I don't like heights very much. So then he looked right at me and he picked me. I'm like, and he said, yeah, come on out here, Pastor Brian, you can show the kids how to do it. And I couldn't say no because, you know, that would look like I was a scaredy cat. So I went to the front. He got me all set up, hooked all the ropes up, turned me around so my back was toward the 85-foot chasm of death. And he described again how the ropes worked. He said, all you need to do is lean back into a sitting position. Just lean back and let the ropes do the work. Trust the ropes. I'm nodding my head the whole time. And he said, okay, lean back. And I went, no. <laughs> he said, no, no, just lean back. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. He said, you and all the students don't think you're afraid. He said, I don't care. I'm not leaning back. And he eventually lowered me. I was like a, I, I was like a crumpled up, uh, paralyzed bat, just uh, all the way down to the bottom. I had trouble trusting the command to trust the ropes. It's funny that the next person who went was a ninth grade girl. And she went down like a Navy SEAL. Doing, doing, doing. <laughs> Completely humiliating. Look at what he says here in Exodus 14. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. Now there are three completely counterintuitive commands in these two verses. First, fear not. What? What, what? I think he just said fear not. You can't see those chariots and soldiers heading our way. You can't see they were trapped by the, the mountains and the sea. We're trapped. What do you mean fear not? In the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, we see a beautiful explanation of what God means when he says fear not. He says, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for... I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So much in this, in this beautiful uh, passage. So when God says, fear not, he's not saying that you're not going to experience fearsome circumstances. He says you will walk through the river, you will walk through the water, you will walk through the fire, but, he says, you are mine. I will be with you. I am greater than that which you fear. Second command we see is also counterintuitive. Stand firm, he says. Many translations render this stand still. Or be still. We have a saying in our culture, don't just stand there, do something. Right? We have a bias toward action. Just at least do something. God is saying the opposite. He said, don't just do something, stand there. Be still. Be silent. What does he mean? He's saying trust the rope. Trust the promise. Trust me. God has led them to a place, taken them south into a place of complete helplessness. There's nothing they can do. They can't fight or flee. They can't save themselves. All they can do is stand still. Stand still and trust the presence and person of Yahweh, the God who is I am. The third command is see the salvation of the Lord. Now something very, very interesting in the language here that we can't see in English the Hebrew word for salvation is from the same root and sounds a lot like the word Yeshua, which many of you know is the New Testament name for Jesus, our Redeemer. Fear not, stand still, see my Yeshua, my salvation. So what's this part of the story telling us about God? It's telling us that God's salvation is not dependent on the courage, the behavior, the action, the attitudes, or even the faith of the people he's saving. It's not dependent on them. They're whining, they're complaining, they're fearful, they're belligerent. You think, I would think God would say something like this. Wow, wow, okay, okay, I get it. You don't remember what slavery is like in the Pharaoh? You wanna go back and serve him? Have it your way. Here's another 400 years. But he doesn't say that. He says, fear not, stand still, and watch me. What's the story telling us about the people, about ourselves, that they didn't deserve God's deliverance? 
In fact, they were being dragged kicking and screaming into their freedom. Anyone here relate to that? Anyone here dragged kicking and screaming into your own salvation? Here it is, what we need to see. Your salvation, my salvation, does not depend on you. does not depend on me. And this sounds just wrong to us. You ask anyone out there in the street tomorrow, you ask a neighbor, you ask someone you work with, hey, I don't know what you believe, but if you believe there's a God in heaven, and if you believe there is a heaven, what will, why should he let you into his heaven someday? Nine out of ten people will say, well, because I'm a pretty good person. I haven't killed anybody. I'm a pretty good person. The Bible tells us that no one will get into heaven because he or she is a pretty good person. That's not the standard. We are delivered, we are saved, we are rescued by the action of God on our behalf. We add nothing. We add nothing to the equation. He doesn't save us because we are good or because even we are holy. He saves us in order to make us holy and good. That's grace. And that grace is uncomfortable because you can't earn it or deserve it. And we love to earn and deserve things, don't we? You can only receive it by faith. And that's the gospel. And that leads us to the third part of the story, the most dramatic part that I'm calling the deliverance. And I'm going to do something here I've not done, I don't think, in a long time, maybe ever, here uh, in a sermon. I'm going to show you a two-minute movie clip. Don't usually do it, but I want to do it this time. This is a two-minute clip from a film called Gods and Kings, directed by a guy named Ridley Scott, who's, to my knowledge, not a believer. It's not a Christian movie. It's a Hollywood movie. But it's the story of the Exodus. And the scene I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you because it captures something of the power and the drama of the moment. We're picking up this story right where Pharaoh and his armies are chasing Israel through the, the, the Red Sea at the moment when Pharaoh re realizes the God he is defying is fighting for the Israelites. So, roll the clip. Let's read how the story goes. Exodus 14, verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch... The Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Now, what do we do with stories like this? Some see these stories as um, sort of religious mythology, just religious mythology. Maybe that's what the director of the film sees the stories as. But if we do that, there's a problem. If we do that, then we also have to do it with the story that we celebrated last weekend of the resurrection. If we do it with the resurrection, if that's mythology, then we can just take the whole Bible and throw it into the trash can. It means nothing. I encourage people to start from the front end of the story and go backwards. Start with the resurrection. If that story is true and historically verifiable and changed the world, let's go backwards. If God can do that, all this other stuff is a piece of cake, right? Or we can look at the story sort of scientifically and study it, as many do. Study it from the historical context. Study it from the archaeological context. Study it from the meteorological context. Is it possible for a wind to blow strong enough to create a pathway of dry land? Or people who study all sorts of that stuff. The way we're looking at it today is this is God's Word. This is the epic story of God coming to the rescue. And this story is critical to our understanding the entire Bible. We see in the next part of the story that God's deliverance also includes his judgment. Pick it up in verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, all, and all of the host of Pharaoh that followed him into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. There's no way to avoid this part of the story. All of Pharaoh's army perished. 
What do we do with stories of God's wrath and judgment? Remember, we covered this a few weeks ago, what God is doing at this part of the story. God is establishing his holiness. He's establishing his authority. He's establishing that there is no God like him. He's establishing that sin is a violation of his holiness. Choosing to worship any God but Yahweh, sin is choosing death over life at its essence. And wrath is what happens when God's holiness confronts humankind's sin. For example, if I go home later today and I take a fork and I stick it into the electrical outlet in my kitchen, I'm going to experience the wrath of electricity. Electricity doesn't hate me, but it is electricity. And I deal with it on its terms, not my terms. That's what's happening here. God is demonstrating who he is through the story of the Exodus. On the one hand, he says, this is what happens when you're covered by the blood of the Lamb. I protect you. I go with you. I save you. And this is what happens when you defy the living God. When you turn away from God, you are covered with the waters of chaos, judgment, and death. Finally, we see in the story that God saves. Verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Now here's what I want you to see. This ancient story, the crossing of the Red Sea, is a paradigm for our faith as Christians. Paul, going all the way to the New Testament, listen to what Paul says, and I'm going to try to tie it back to this story so it makes sense. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's how he refers to Satan, our enemy. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. In other words, you were, all of you, all of us, were at one point slaves under the curse of death, serving an evil master, all of us were there without exception. Verse 4, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You have been covered by the blood of the Lamb, who is Christ himself. Verse 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We have been crossed over from slavery to freedom, from death to life, and we're on our way to the promised land, to the heavenly realms. Verse 8, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Fear not, stand still, see the salvation of your God. A few years ago, uh, I got a call uh, from a man who um, asked if he could talk to me about something really serious. It sounded important. He wanted me to meet him somewhere, not even here at church. So I said, sure. Met him. Uh, he was um, uh, toward the end of his life, and he said to me, he, he told me he'd been a believer for most of his life, follower of Jesus most of his life, but he said, I've done something. It was a long time in the past. I did something that I'm fearful will keep me out of heaven, he said. He's really serious. I mean, tears and everything, really serious. And so I, before I even heard what it was, I said, look, let me just explain to you what you already believe. So I explained to him the gospel. I explained to him the, the um, power of the work of Christ on the cross. And he nodded, nodded, nodded. Then he said to me, yeah, 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 I know that, but you don't know what I've done. And it occurred to me that this man, despite being set free, was still living as a slave for all those years. It's possible to be set free and still live as a slave. It's possible to be delivered from captivity and then fall straight into the garbage can. The gospel says in Christ you have been set free from sin and death. Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul again. There is therefore, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. It's done. It's a fact, Paul says. It doesn't matter what you've done. I didn't need to hear what he had done. 
doesn't matter what you feel. That's a fact. But you do have an enemy, a former master, that wants to keep you enslaved. One of the names of Satan in the Bible is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one who wants to keep you captive to shame, captive to fear, captive to your sin, captive to your past. But listen to Paul again. Romans 8, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. Listen, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So, here's the point for us. How are we today experiencing and living out the story of the Exodus? In Christ... Our sins have been covered by the blood of the Lamb. In Christ, we have a new identity. No longer slaves, but children. In Christ, we have already crossed over from death to life, from captivity to freedom. Our salvation has already been accomplished, finished. So, if we have already been set free, if we are now sons and daughters, why then would we ever live like slaves again? Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of your God. It's the gospel. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord, we thank you today for this ancient story. Sometimes we see these stories in the Old Testament and we, we, we struggle to know how to relate to them. Are they about us? What are they about? But they are about us. We thank you for the promise of your deliverance, your salvation. And we confess that even though you've set us free, sometimes we insist on living like slaves of our old master. So remind us, again, through your word and by your spirit of who you are. Remind us of what you've already done. And remind us of who we now are in you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our closing song? Our benediction today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and verse 36. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said, If the Son sets you free, then you shall be free indeed. Amen. Have a great day.